Hello everyone. Um, Andy's obviously done his research well and he's actually told you a bit of a story that I'm going to tell you in a minute, but I'll, I'm sure you don't mind hearing it twice. Ten years ago, the UK was an energy desert. Less than 4% of our energy came from renewable sources. Malta was the only European country that generated less renewables than us. Now it's grown to nearly 20%, and it's becoming normal to see pa solar panels and turbines all over the United Kingdom. Renewable energy has been a significant part of my life for much of that time. I first started to get interested when we were renovating our house exactly 10 years ago this month. As a result of that experience, I built UGen, an interactive website for people who are interested in generating renewable energy. And I ran it until earlier this year. Given that the growth of renewables has been so much faster and greater than that of permaculture, I've been asked to look back over what I learned running UGen and share any of it that might be useful to you in attracting more people to take up permaculture. I was asked to talk about the role user forums have played in that growth. Now, I'm not going to pretend that they've been the catalyst that stimulated it. I don't think it would have happened without the intro introduction of financial incentives. However, I do think that they've been important in facilitating take-up, giving people the confidence to go ahead and try new and unfamiliar technology. But before I share what I've learned, I'm just going to tell you a bit about my first experience with renewable energy, just to illustrate where things were t 10 years ago and to compare it with where they are today. We'd bought a 1950s house. It was structurally sound, but it hadn't changed much since it was built. It needed quite a lot of renovation, and I wanted it to make it as energy efficient as I could. Um, but I didn't know anything much about how to do it and where to start. The internet wasn't quite what it is today, and so I couldn't actually find much online. It was ringing people up, getting leaflets through the door and stuff like that. One of the things, as Andy just mentioned, was that the gas boiler was um, on its last legs, and we knew that we were going to have to replace it. So I started looking at renewable heat as an alternative. What, what might I use? What might be viable? I found lots of information about the te various renewable technologies, but most of them focused on the science behind them. How, for example, solar panels turn the heat, um, the heat or the light from the sun into um, electricity. What I wanted to know was the practical stuff. Was it suitable for my house? Would it work with my existing heating and plumbing system? What, what about the carbon emissions? How would they compare with a condensing gas boiler, for example? From what I read, a biomass boiler seemed the most likely to suit us. So next I wanted to find out about what was it going to cost and things like that. There were only two suppliers in the southwest. Neither would come to my house to do a survey. Both quoted over the phone with no accurate figures about the size of the house and more importantly, no figures about the heat demand of the house. And as you've heard, there was an enormous difference between the most expensive and the cheapest. So, hoping to get some expert, expert advice on what it cost. Um, and also, just I wanted to know how to assess what the quotes have said and how to compare them. I phoned the Energy Saving Trust, an advice charity that was at that time funded by government to, give, to help people make their homes more energy efficient. They said, sorry, can't help you, this is a commercial decision. Oh. So that commercial decision isn't actually the time when you need that help most. So we bought a gas condensing boiler, we installed a wood burning stove in the living room and we're very happy that that's what we did. Were I in the same situation now, it would be easy to find loads of good sources of information. In fact, the problem now is probably there are too many and you, know, you can't work out which is the best. 
I could use forums to ask others about how their boiler works. I'd have a choice of 30 installers within a 30 mile radius of where I live. Southwest is particularly full of renewable energy things. Um, I'd have a, I could look on UGen to see which installers had been recommended by their customers. The industry's certification body ensures that they do a thorough survey and I get government incentive payments for seven years. Back then it seemed safer and infinitely cheaper to go with what I know, I knew. Now there is really much more choice. As a result of this experience, I noticed the need for an independent source of practical advice um, and that there was a gap in the market. And the idea just kept nagging away at me. Having initially thought there's, an idea, there's a, a gap there for someone to fill, I began to think, maybe, maybe I can do it. I started exploring it in earnest in 2007. And in April 2009, the full website was launched. Our vision was of a UK where homes are energy efficient and, the local, and local power generation from renewable sources is the norm. Our purpose, to make it easy for people to get the information they need, to be confident that they're making a good decision about renewable energy. And that might well be that it's not suitable for them. We also wanted to help them to find an installer they can trust. And people began to come to the site. In those early days, every comment on the blog, every installer that signed up, each person that left a review, it was really exciting. Earlier this year, the website was getting 60,000 visits a month, and we were still enjoying reading all the comments and questions. More than one and a half million people have used it since it launched. I ran UGEN until March this year, when it moved to a new home at the National Energy Foundation and it sits comfortably there alongside complementary sites such as super homes and log pile. The invitation to speak here came just after I'd handed over the reins to NEF. A perfect time to look back over what we'd achieved, what had worked well, and just as importantly, what hadn't worked. And this talk all also gave me the, the reason to do that. So I've picked out the things that I think might be most of use, use to you in encouraging or supporting the wider take-up of permaculture. Now my first point is that timing is everything. If I'd launched UGEN in 2005, when I first identified the need, it almost certainly would have sunk without trace. There just wasn't enough interest in renewables at that stage. Three key developments made it possible. First was the introduction of Web 2.0. We're so used to interactive websites now that it, it seems bizarre to think that actually they're really, really quite new. Just seven years ago, people were still figuring out how to make this exciting development work. Facebook and Twitter were also in their infancy. Being it, we, I mean, we were really lucky. We started up just as they were sort of coming on stream. Um, and being in at the beginning made it possible to reach like-minded people with no marketing budget. And I'm sure that the no marketing budget bit is also important for permaculture. <laughs> um, being on Twitter early enabled us to develop a really strong presence as a leader in the sector, something that would be really difficult now. And most significantly, in July 2009, the government issued a consultation document on the financial incentives for renewable energy, kicking off a whole new level of interest in renewables. Of course, whether you've got your timing right or not is much easier to see in retrospect. But it's always worth asking, is now the right time before you launch anything new? One of the joys of an interactive website is that your users will tell you what their priorities are. And it's very likely that they won't want the information that you think they will. When I planned the layout of the website, I thought visitors would be asking about the things I'd struggled with. Their difficulties getting independent advice that looked at the whole house, 
why the price variations were so high, or how you could compare carbon emissions. They did want to know these things, but those types of questions were absolutely dwarfed by their confusion over the financial incentives. Essentially, I became an expert in the minutiae of the three major government schemes, the feed-in tariff, the renewable heat incentive, and the Green Deal. I explained the rules, I investigated why energy companies were so slow paying the feed-in tariff, I countered myths that solar PV was no good anymore once the tariff fell. Ah, the list goes on and on. And by the time the domestic renewable heat incentive eventually became a reality, even the government had realised that independent forums are significant in helping the market work. Ofgem invited our users to help them test the application form for the new incentive as they built it. So they were getting real-time feedback from you know, people who actually are wanting to apply. Um, and lots of our users were really happy to take part in that. The Department for Energy and Climate Change invited me to join its working group on consumer protection. And I was on an Ofgem forum as well. And this gave me much better to access to civil servants and swifter answers to questions, and a chance to get our users' views heard. My uh, Q&A blog on the renewable heat incentive is one of the most visited on the UGEN website. Um, it, most of the information on it can be found on a whole load of different websites. But the great advantage that an interactive site like UGEN has is that visitors can ask their questions and get an answer reasonably quickly. And because of its independence, it can take a strong view, which official sites are unable to do. For every one person asking a question, there are probably loads and loads of others who want to know the answer. So as long as you've got a good search facility on a website or a forum, there are really good ways of answering the questions um, and making sure that those answers reach a much wider audience. And also, it means that you don't have to answer the same questions over and over and over again. One of the biggest challenges I faced setting up UGEN was that you just don't know if something's going to work until you try it. I've got lots of experience in marketing, where you can generally test a campaign before you send out all the material and tweak it to see if you can improve how it does. But when you're a build, building a website, that's an, there's not always an option of dipping your toe in the water. Sometimes you just have to hold your nose and jump straight in at the deep end. One challenging area for us was advertising. In the early days, we used Google, which serves up relevant text ads based on the content of each page of your website. We got really good returns for it, from it, much better than average. Then we noticed that the ads were serving up, they were serving up tended to be for all the dodgiest cowboy installers out there and were completely undermining our directory of installers on the site and, of course, our values. So AdWords and the useful income it generated had to go. Next, we tried a so-called ethical feed of ads. It didn't make so much money. It also fed completely inappropriate ads in a rather different way. <laughs> um, and so, reluctantly, because none of us were good at telesales at all, we brought advertising in-house. On a course I went on some years ago, the trainer kept saying, there's no failure, only feedback. Then I found that a bit trite and I couldn't quite get my head around it, but running UGEN has taught me the truth of it. I've learned so much more from trying, seeing what happens, and responding to feedback than from books or from training courses. But of course, you permaculture guys, you know the true value of feedback. My next point is, be specific about who you want to reach. Even massive global companies like Coca-Cola don't target everyone. For smaller enterprises, it's particularly important to know who, that you know who it is you want to engage. 
And I'm going to give you an example here of three audiences that we, want, we targeted for you, Jen. Firstly, I wanted to reach early adopters of renewable energy. I hoped that their stories um, and tips from their experiences, would be, they'd share them on the website and help other people. But also, if appropriate, we wanted them to recommend their installer. Our main audience was users, people who might be interested in renewable energy. And so that we could think about how can we find these people, how can we target them with our marketing, we put together characteristics of those who were the most likely to be getting involved right at the beginning. Um, it was still pretty expensive back then, so they had to have some spare money. So we thought they'd probably be older people whose children have left home. They might be living off the gas, off the gas grid, where heating in, is much more expensive, so the more incentive to change. Probably they'd be well educated. And then, so then we started thinking, OK, where do they shop? What clubs are they going to be in? So we could find those people. Our third key market was installers. I didn't just want any old installer on the site, um, but just the ones that readers could trust. So we positioned ourselves as offering word of mouth on the web, and we aim to appeal to those who care about their reputation, who get much of their work through word of mouth. And as well as the markets we wanted to reach, it was also really important that we identified the ones we didn't want to reach. An example of that is the Green Building Forum, which probably quite a lot of you know. It's a great place where green building professionals share and discuss ideas alongside self-builders and DIYers. Its audience are the type of people who, when they get a new gadget, they want to take it apart and see how it works. Ours were the people who just want to know how to make it work, and preferably with as little involvement from them as possible. This kind of positioning is important. Although my intention when I set up UGEN was to contribute um, to a reduction of carbon emissions in the UK, I took a conscious decision that it would not be a green website. Instead, we recognise that people have a range of motivations for installing renewable energy. And our place was to answer questions like, is it suitable? Will it be effective? And to prevent people making expensive mistakes. So, for example, in the early days of the solar rush, um, there was a lot of disapproving muttering on Twitter about solar bling and how you should insulate first before you generate renewable energy. I agree, that's the ideal. But we didn't join in the moralising. Sometimes it's better to meet people where they are and move on from there. It turns out that generating solar electricity really connects people with energy and that as they generate it, they understand it better and become more interested in other, often more disruptive things that they can do to be more energy efficient. The other thing I know from a marketing background is that just giving people information about how something works isn't enough. It's also important to tell our visitors why they might consider investing in renewable energy. In marketing speak, we translated features into benefits. Those of you who know about marketing will know how important this is. It helps people know whether something is relevant to them. So, for example, if here in London we put a four kilowatt array of solar panels on a roof, uh, one of the features would be that it would generate 4,000 kilowatts nearly of electricity a year. But that doesn't mean much to most people. Um, what they want to know is if they're generating 4,000 4, kilowatts of electricity a year, what does it do for them? What are the benefits? And that will depend on their motivations. So if they're worried about their carbon footprint, it's going to be the carbon savings. If they're worried about energy security, um, they may feel safer generating their own electricity. If they're approaching retirement, it might be that the feed-in tariff will give them a better return on their investment than an annuity would. Since I was asked to do this talk, 
I've read quite a lot about permaculture, and most of what I've read has focused on the features, and it hasn't talked about the benefits at all. Whether it's encouraging people to go on courses, to buy permaculture produce, or to change how they live, people need to know what's in it for them, and the planet, and other things, but um, start, most, most people, it starts with them. I started by saying that, the, that renewable energy wouldn't have taken off at such a rate without the government incentives. So it's difficult to equate the potential growth of permaculture to that of renewables. Because um, I'm pretty sure, as the government slashes away at the renewable, renewable funding, it's not going to be doling out money for permaculture. Um, so, um, but before you start thinking about user forums, I think also that, that as a community you could start thinking, you could think hard about how you make it as easy as possible for people to access permaculture. Over the past few weeks, I've asked quite a lot of people, um, have they heard of permaculture? And if so, what do you think it is? The good news is that most people say yes to the first question, but they're pretty sketchy in their answers to the second. No dig gardening, composting toilets and organic gardening, planting at the right stage of the moon, messy gardens, not weeding. <laughs> no one had a holistic picture. I'm not surprised. You don't make it that easy. First, there are the three ethics. Then there are 12 principles. Once you've digested them, you can go on a two-day introductory course. Then there's the jargon. When I was wondering which seminar to attend this morning, there were some talks where I had no idea from the blurb or the title what they were about. And for someone new to a subject, that's quite off-putting. So I ask you to think, how much of the language you use is exclusive? And are you doing it on purpose? <laughs> Nearly there. User forums can be a very effective way of growing a community. They can just as easily become cliquey and exclude people. Whether you've got an information website or a user forum, I'd like to leave you with three suggestions that I hope will be helpful in your efforts to make permaculture more mainstream. First, use plain English, or the equivalent in your country, to, and avoid jargon. Secondly, tell people what's in it for them. What are the benefits? And I think this is probably my most important one. Meet them where they are. Welcome them in. Help them with what they're interested in. This way, they may just adapt their life in a small way, or they may be inspired to try more and adopt more of the permaculture principles. Either way, they're treading more lightly on the planet and positive messages about permaculture will spread more widely. Thank you.